So I want to start by going back in time to five years ago. As many people know, you warned that the greatest risk of global catastrophe wasn't a war, but a highly infectious virus. Why didn't anybody listen? And if some people did, what was done to prepare for the pandemic that exists now? Well, not enough was done. The a system wasn't built. We didn't really do the number of simulations to try and figure out, okay, how are we going to connect up? the diagnostics, how are we going to get the vaccine going? Uh, there were some investments, for example, uh, our foundation, Welcome Trust, and a number of governments uh, created CEPI, which is about making vaccine platforms that are ready when we get surprised to manufacture a new vaccine faster than it's been done in the past. So some work was done, but in retrospect, you know, the saddest thing is to be able to say, yes, that was right. But the whole point of the speech was to drive uh, the research and the planning and the simulation, which would have allowed us to stop this at a very early stage. And in terms of the global response now, many countries, including the UK and the US, have been criticized for not doing enough testing and not doing it fast enough. What is your assessment of the global response so far and specifically of President Trump's response to this crisis in the US? Well, I'm sure there'll be plenty of time once we're on top of this to look at, you know, before the epidemic hit, uh, what more could have been done uh, when the epidemic hit. You know, I don't think any country has a perfect record. Taiwan comes close. They really were talking about it. And it's unfortunate they weren't part of WHO to really get those uh, warnings paid attention to. You know, most countries didn't see it as as big a problem as it's ended up being. And of course, when you have exponential growth, that means if you miss, you know, three doubling times, you know, it's eight times as big uh, and much, much harder to get under control. So a few countries, particularly those that had the experience of dealing with MERS or SARS, they were the, the fastest to respond. Uh, South Korea is an example uh, of that. China, which had a lot of cases, uh, now is in a very different state where they are uh, able to get most people going back to school and back to work. And so there's lessons about what did they do to drop the numbers and what are they doing to avoid a rebound? Because until we get a vaccine that we've given to a high percentage of the global population, we will be at risk of rebound. And what would you say is the single most important thing that needs to happen now? I mean, the World Health Organization has said, test, test, test. Is testing the key here? Or what about, for example, the role of technology? Uh, we've seen some Asian countries use technology to spread information so quickly, which has helped them fight the virus. What do you think is that single most important thing that has to happen right now? Well, testing is what guides you to see, do you need to do more social isolation, or have you gotten to a point where you can start to open up a bit? It can't just be numbers of tests, though. You have to uh, have the results coming back in less than 24 hours, and you have to prioritize who gets tested. The demand for tests exceeds supply in every country, and some countries really stepped in, like South Korea, and made sure the right people were being tested. They had a unified system that could look at the individual cases and, and weigh the criteria. The US does not have that. We have so many different companies, labs, uh, and most of the tests go in without any criteria. And so now we have these backlogs that really devalue uh, what can be done with those tests. So the fact that the numbers have gone up doesn't mean that we're doing this well at all. Uh, that is still ahead of us to get organized on uh, prioritizing properly, you know, so your contacts, if you test positive here, before they become infectious, that they need to isolate. Uh, the PCR test is sensitive enough to catch it even before you'll have symptoms. And that's the ideal case where you don't go on to infect anyone else, which is the key to bringing those, those numbers down. So today, the appropriate testing and isolation are the primary tactics. In the midterm, getting some drugs that will reduce the hospitalization and death rate, that will be very important. And the ultimate solution is a highly effective, safe vaccine 
Uh, but getting billions of doses is hard. And our foundation uh, works in all of those areas. We're providing funding uh, even now in parallel to scale up the manufacturing of the most promising vaccines, way more than we'll end up picking because even though you know that's a few billion dollars of manufacturing capacity, the fact that it will be ready because we, we do it in parallel, uh, that anything that cuts a month off of uh, the time until we vaccinate is is worth, you know, literally uh, hundreds of billions, if not trillions. And can you just briefly expand more on that investment? So, as you say, your foundation has announced a hundred million dollar investment to go towards this global response. Can you just outline some of the areas where that's going to? Yeah, a lot of that's going uh, to help the capacity in the developing world uh, staff up. You know, some uh, actually helped China with the early response. Uh, some is now helping in Europe and the U.S. We think a lot about the developing countries, and they have the biggest challenge because the social isolation is much harder for them. You know, just getting the food supply to work reliably, you know, the distance when you live in uh, urban slum area, you're not going to be able to be quite as as separated as would be ideal there. So those countries, even though their numbers are quite small today, Sadly, it's very likely that many of those countries won't be able to contain it, you know, unlike, say, China, which is at 0.01 percent, or some of the other countries, uh, a lot of the rich countries should be able to keep it to a few percent infected. These countries, many of them, will experience a widespread epidemic uh, so that over time the majority of their people uh, are infected. And, you know, that'll lead to hospital overloading, uh, you know, deaths from other conditions and, you know, very substantial burden uh, for those countries. And let's talk more about that big picture then for the developing world. I mean, we're at this point, it seems like quite a scary point where, as you say, the virus is just starting to spread in developing countries. We know it's already spread throughout Africa, but hasn't quite taken off yet. How big of an impact do you think it will have in terms of deaths and the number of infections? And how worried are you about the ability of developing countries to fight this? We could get lucky and there could be something about whether that means that some countries have lower force of infection. We don't know that. Our assumption has to be, because we are seeing in the southern hemisphere, places like Australia, quite a bit of infection, uh, that it's not you know, dramatically seasonal and that it's just gotten started slower in Africa. You know, I hope something shows up that changes that. It's very easy to say this disease has about a 1% case fatality rate. And when you overload your hospitals, you can get up to a 2 3% rate. Now, then again, Africa has a younger population, so that brings your numbers down. But the comorbidities in terms of smoke inhalation, both indoor and outdoor, TB, HIV, malnutrition, those are much higher there. And so you'd have a, you know, quite a bit of uncertainty, but it's not impossible that you'd see you know, 2% uh, overall death rate, which is, you know, a, a horrific situation, potentially even worse as you have panic and other health care is very disrupted. And do you think, I mean, you mentioned the difficulty of self-isolation. Is it, is the whole lockdown approach that we see in developed countries, is that sort of doomed to fail in developing countries? Because for some people, it's just not practical. If they have to go outside to collect food or sell goods for their livelihood, or as you say, if they live in cramped conditions or slums, how can that possibly work? It's a, a super good question. You know, many of the developing countries are uh, going to do their best on this. So India is doing it, you know, now... It's early days, they have to figure out, do food delivery people, are they allowed to still uh, do their jobs or not? Uh, so these things are tricky to put into place. The exact, you know, what is essential? You know, can you go out and, you know, walk your dog or which businesses should be there? And, you know, the U.S. didn't do much practice thinking about this, so we're figuring it out. For the developing countries, you know, I'd say it's definitely worth trying to flatten the curve but the likelihood that you'll be successful and only have a few percent infected, somewhere as you go down level of income, particularly in those urban slum areas, uh, I worry that it will not be effective. But 
Uh, even if it delays and spread things out, the number of health workers who get infected, the overload of the medical system, there is value to it in terms of the speed of which the infection gets into the broad population. And is there any reason to be optimistic? I mean, you've said you're an optimist and the world could use some good news or at least some hope. Is there a reason to be optimistic about the ability of these poorer countries to fight this crisis, to fight the virus? Where are the sort of pockets of hope? Well, the rural areas, the force of infection should be reduced, particularly if people understand uh, about the mixing. Although right now you have people leaving urban areas going back to the rural areas, so it won't be zero. You know, we will get a vaccine and, you know, the role of our foundation is to make sure that medicines like this are available uh, to the entire world. Uh, we have partners like Gavi who will help us with that distribution. I'm sure governments will step on up on this. And so, you know, over the next couple of years, hopefully in 18 months, we'll get that vaccine and, and things can uh, be so you're not completely changing the economy uh, because of coronavirus. And economies can come back as painful as this is, as unprecedented as it is, you know, the deaths, those you can't reverse. And so, you know, right now uh, people are scared, people are doing less economically, governments are trying to make sure that's a lot of people so that the, the case infection rate goes to uh, below one. But yes, eventually uh, these tools, hopefully one of the platforms we've been investing in actually for a decade, like the RNA vaccines, those are the most flexible and easiest to ramp up. Uh, so we're hoping uh, that that's the way we get to the, the vaccine that gets us out of this terrible problem. And I want to talk more about the vaccine in a minute, but in terms of the obligation that rich countries have to help poor countries. I mean, rich countries are struggling to support their own citizens through this crisis. So what is the obligation that rich countries have to help the developing world? Well, that's always a question. There are countries that spend uh, more than 0.7% of GDP uh, in regular times helping the poorest get things like measles vaccines and greatly uplift their country so that they're stable and participating in the world economy. You know, the UK is a generous donor, Sweden, Norway, you know, Germany's become a lot more generous. And so you can see that uh, ranking there. I do think, uh, despite the fact that you've got huge domestic problems and huge economic problems, you know, that idea that, you know, you can keep that 0.7% or even you know, go up as much as a factor or two above that because the impact of those dollars on helping things not completely deteriorate, helping hold things together, helping accelerate that vaccine manufacturer, I think the case on that will be compelling. But, you know, everybody's dealing with an immense number of priorities. Then again, they've, they've decided to not operate under the normal fiscal constraints. And so, the idea of, say, tens of billions helping uh, buy those vaccines and get that manufacturing, you know, it used to be in the aid game that was, you know, a very, very big number. Now, when you're talking about making it easier uh, to not have infection coming back into your country, you can make a uh, both a humanitarian and a self-interested argument that, you know, even a few percent going against that for the rich countries would be a wise investment. And do you think this is the most concerted global effort ever to find a vaccine? And could we see one before 18 months time? You know, if everything went perfectly with the RNA vaccines, the Moderna's already in a human trial, you could do a little better than that. But remember, we're talking about making billions of doses and even just to have the glass vials, the fill, finish, the distribution, uh, you know, 18 months would be a lot has to go well, not everything uh, to hit that. There are many constructs being worked on. The experienced vaccine companies bring a lot to this because understanding safety uh, and efficacy and how you go through the trials. So we need some new ones, which for the people we're backing are RNA, DNA. And then there's four others that are more conventional, uh, sure to work, but slightly longer schedules. And we have to fund the science, the testing, and the manufacturing capacity of, 
of of all of those over you know at least seven or eight we need to uh, be ready to go once you have safety and efficacy. What responsibility do you think national governments, philanthropies, and the private sector have to cooperate in order to find these solutions? And, and where do tech companies fit in in this picture? Well, the deep expertise on making vaccines is, you know, some at the academic level, government research level, but a lot, particularly safety manufacturing, is in the private sector. And uh, the government's not used to figuring out, okay, who's good at what and what's the right way to do that. You know, our foundation plays a role there because we're uh, funding the invention of vaccines and the scale up and low cost vaccines. That's, you know, what we're doing all the time to reduce deaths uh, in the in the poor countries. And so, you know, private sector is very important, but the overall template has to come from government. And Government here, where it you know doesn't know how you know who can make ventilators or how uh, you know testing gets overly backlogged, uh, that is a big challenge. We don't have, we didn't practice at all for what we're going through here, and even you know who's responsible, uh, and is it somebody who actually has the right domain knowledge? That's uh, not totally clear as we try to move through this. There are people like Dr. Fauci who brings a scientific data-driven view to these things. And so it's great that he's uh, in a, a strong position. He and I talked a lot about how we get all the different actors, including you know, US government, our foundation, partners like IHME and Gavi, and various of the companies that will be key to this, bring them together. The tech companies don't make vaccines, uh, but they can do a lot to let people still connect together, uh, they can do a lot to let us look at the data and have deep insights into that. You know, all these articles are being published. And so Microsoft and many others are letting you navigate that information in a, uh, a very rich way. And so they'll step up. Believe me, anything I'm calling a private company that's clear, well-defined, and, you know, they know if, if I'm calling, it's likely to really make a difference. They're, you know, they all say, yes to these things. I mean, there's this is so top of mind. We've got the entire economy uh, shut down. So everybody's trying to pitch in, uh, coordinating that, you know, when a lot of people don't understand, okay, which tests are the most important or which information is. It's a bit difficult. And so key people at the foundation are, you know, working night and day to try and pull these resources together. But, you know, the when we had asks for people, you know, they are dying to help out. And what about that trade-off? You just mentioned, obviously, the economic pain. What do you think the right balance is between the trade-off of protecting people's lives and the economic hit? I mean, do you see a situation where the global economy could be virtually at a standstill for a year or even more? Well, it won't go to zero, but it will shrink. Global GDP is going to take, uh, you know, probably the biggest hit ever, you know, maybe the depression was worse or 1873, I don't know. But in my lifetime, there, this will be the greatest economic hit. But you don't have a choice. People act like you have a choice. People don't feel like going to the stadium uh, when they might get infected. You know, it, it's not the government who's saying, OK, just ignore this disease. And, you know, people are deeply affected by seeing these deaths, by knowing they could be part of the transmission chain and you know, old people, uh, their parents, their grandparents could be affected by this. And so you don't, you know, you don't get to say, uh, ignore uh, what's going on here. There, are, there will be the ability, particularly in rich countries, to open up if things are done well over the next few months. But for the world at large, Normalcy only returns when we've largely vaccinated the entire global population. And, and so, you know, although there's a lot of work on testing, a lot of work on drugs that we're involved with, you know, trying to achieve that ambitious goal, which has never been done for the vaccine, that rises to the top of the list. 
And finally, I want to look ahead into the future. Once this pandemic, once we find solutions to this, looking far ahead into the future, do you think that people will just return to a sort of short-termism view where we're too focused on economic gain to invest properly and prepare properly for another once-in-a-century pandemic? And what is your message right now to world leaders and global policymakers to avoid the world being caught off guard again? Well, there's, there's no doubt having paid many trillions of dollars more than we might have had to if we'd been properly ready, people will this time because it you know, affected the rich countries. You know, this is the biggest event that people will experience in their entire lives. We will have standby diagnostics. We will have deep antiviral li libraries. We will have antibody scale up. We will have vaccine platforms. We will have early warning systems. We will do germ games. The cost of doing all those things well is very small compared to what we're going through here. And so now people realize, okay, there really is a meaningful probability every 20 years or, or so with lots of world travel that one of these will come along. And, and so the citizens expect the government to make it a priority. Uh, you know, it won't cost as much as the defense budget, say, but it will be a, a meaningful investment. Some of those investments will help medical work in other areas. You know, a vaccine platform, the, you know, cheap, fast diagnostics. These are not things that are only valuable uh, for an epidemic. So you're confident then that lessons will be learned from this experience and that the, the pain, both in terms of the loss of life and the economic hit, will be bad enough to make people prepare for next time? Yes, but it shouldn't have required a, you know, many trillions of dollars uh, loss to get there. I remember when I put up the slide in that talk and, you know, I, I showed that it was trillions of dollars. I felt like, wow, that is so gigantic. Why aren't people you know, saying, you know, 10, 20, 30 billion, uh, you know, which in a, in a government budget sense is almost nothing. Uh, but yes, this time we've been whacked on the head here at home, people we know, uh, the science is there, countries will step forward. Bill Gates, thank you for your time. Thank you.